told the guy, he said, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. You know, I'm very careful about uh, who I uh, put in front of you guys. I, I take this very serious. I just don't let anybody get up, you know, and speak to you guys, all right? So when we bring people in, these are people who are, I'm, I'm only bringing in the best. Uh, without further ado, he is from uh, Atlanta originally, um, went to the University of Tennessee and played football there, um, is a business owner now. I mean, phenomenal, phenomenal testimony, story, all right? So um, I'm not going to steal his thunder. Please put your hands together for my guy and what I believe is going to be number one speaker in the world, Mr. Inky Johnson. Put your hands together, guys. Every day I'm chasing something different. Every day the way I operate is totally different and it's not about the product for me as much as it is about the process. And what I mean about the process, the process saved my life. You see, my mother had me when she was 15 years old, right? Over on the east side of Atlanta, we came up in this neighborhood by the name of Kirkwood, drug dealer on every corner, gang members in the neighborhood, two bedroom home, 14 people, used to sleep on the floor. Got the opportunity to sleep in the bed one time out of the week. It was six of us in the bed, three at the foot, three at the head. And I came up with this dream pretty quick. I said, man, I want to go to the NFL because I had eight uncles in that house, all eight of which are still going in and out of prison. And so pretty quick, I said, man, I want to go to the NFL. And so I went to my big cousin tomorrow one night. I said, man, listen, I want to go to the NFL. And so we got to work for this thing. So the thing we're going to do every night, we're going to be patient. We're going to engage in consistent action. Every night, we're going to race light pole to light pole with no shoes. So every night, we would get out on the street, race light pole to light pole. One night, a coach came down the street. He signed me and my cousins up for organized sports, right? First time being in organized sports. We get in organized sports. The thing was, after practice, everybody would leave to go home. And I always had to sit on the bench and wait on my mother because she worked at Wendy's. And so when my mother would show up in the park, it would be about 10 o'clock, 10.30 at night. So I'm sitting there, and when my mother would pull up, she drove an old Buick Regal, hubcaps off the car, seats torn up, the car was all beat up. And she would pull up in the park 10.30 at night. I would jump off the bench, I would sprint over to my mother, I would say, Mom, if you don't mind, can you please sit back in your car and turn on your car lights? I have to do some extra drills, I have to go to the NFL. She would never have to work another day in your life. And I knew my mother was tired. And every night, my mother would sit back in that car and those car lights would hit that field and he had a seven-year-old kid doing back pedaling drills, running sprints, running laps, chasing his dream to go to the NFL. But just beyond those car lights, I could always connect with my mother's eyes, so it made me dig a little bit deeper, it made me push myself a little bit further, it made me work a little bit harder. It created a certain level of sweat equity in what I was doing. It created a certain level of pride in what I was doing. You know why people quit? People don't have pride in what they do. You know why people stop? They're selfish and it's just about them. But when you have a bigger purpose to why you're doing what you're doing and you want to honor the sacrifices that others have made for you, it's nothing for you to keep going when you hit adversity. If every decision and choice you make is just about you, at a certain point you're going to hit something that's a lot tougher than you and it's going to make you quit because you don't have a driving force for why you do what you do. But when I got up to the University of Tennessee, it was simple. It was simple for me to give everything I had. My freshman year, I played special teams. My sophomore season, I broke the star lineup, had a really strong sophomore season. The summer heading into my junior year, I still remember the day where I was sitting in our film room and I was watching film on the California Bears. My defensive backs coach, Larry Slade, came in the room. He said, Inky, I got some good news for you. I dropped the click. I said, what is it? He said, man, you're a projected top 30 draft pick, son. He said, all you have to do is play the next 10 football games. You're an automatic multimillionaire. I went out of the room. I called my mother and my grandmother on the three-way. I said, after this season, there will be no more struggling. I said, we would never miss another meal. I said, we would never experience another Christmas where we have to stand on the side of the curb and just be grateful. And I hung it up. First football game, I went out, played great, got an interception, shut Cal down. Second game, we're playing against Air Force, got late in the game, fourth quarter, guy dropped back, he threw the ball to a receiver coming out of my sideline. Me and the guy, we went head on. Soon as I hit the guy, I felt as if every breath in my body left. Body went completely limp, fell to the ground, I blacked out. Never happened to me before. When my eyes opened, I'll never forget, my teammates ran over, they said, Ink, get up, let's go. I said, I can't. I said, I can't move. They said, what do you mean you can't move? You're out of lockdown corner, man, we need you, let's go. I said, I know, man, but this time I can't move. I flipped my head up to the sky, I said, God. I said, surely nothing is happening in this moment that can alter my life. 
They got me over to the hospital, they took me back, they ran CAT scans, they brought me back into my room, and all in a 15 second time frame, the doctor came running in from the opposite side. He said, hey, get in there, we gotta rush this guy back to emergency surgery, he's about to die. I said, what? He said, son, you have busted up the clavian artery in your chest, you're bleeding internally, we have to rush you back, take the main vein out of your left leg, plug it into your chest in order to save your life. When I opened my eyes from recovery, the same doctor was over me. He said, son, has some good news and some bad news for you. I said, you got some bad news for me? I have to tell him I was about to die. I'm still alive. How bad can it get? I'm still here. He said, the good news is we saved your life. I said, thank you, sir. He said, the bad news is, Inc., you have nerve damage in your right shoulder. I said, okay, cool. He said, but son, it's a strong possibility that you probably can never play the game of football again in your life. I said, no way. I said, no disrespect to you, Doc, but I've been working for this ever since I was seven years old. I said, no disrespect to you, Doc, but you wasn't in the park with me and my mother when I was seven years old and she was sitting in that Buick Riga after she got done working at Wendy's. No disrespect to you, Doc, but you didn't come up in that two-bedroom home, 14 people sleeping on the floor. No disrespect to you, Doc, but you didn't miss those meals and stay focused and never made an excuse. I never cheated. I never cheated. Like my conscience still until this day won't let me, like I can't cheat. I can't look myself in the mirror and say, Ink, you did a good job knowing that I cheated. I can't cheat. One of the greatest pieces of advice that my mother gave me was this, son, whenever you start, you make sure you finish it. And the problem with the world today, people get involved with things and if they don't like a certain person, if they don't like the process, if it's not what they thought it was, they quit. And what they don't understand about quitting, quitting becomes a habit that doesn't just affect you. Later on in life, when you get a wife and you get some kids or you get a family, it's gonna come back to hunt you and it will one day affect them. That is why I tell you the process is more important than the product. It's not even about the outcome for me. It's about can you take pride in what you do as an individual and every night when you look in the mirror, knowing that you gave everything you had to it. And we have to get to the point where we're willing to impose our will on certain things. Impose your will on it. My life totally changed. And they gave me an opportunity to stop. And most people, when you give them an opportunity to stop while they're chasing something, they take advantage of it because they feel as if, man, why did this have to happen to me? I felt as if, why not me? This is the perfect opportunity to use this to be a blessing to somebody else. And you know what? It's not even about me to be truthful. It's not even about me. Now it's about repaying the people that invested in me and saw something in me when I couldn't see it in myself. At a certain point in life, it can't just be about you. And the moment that we understand that and every day we wake up, we understand that life is a blessing and life is a gift. And if you were to check out today, how would you want to be remembered? It's bigger than you.